to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin. This is the gospel of Christ to proclaim the news unto the poor. The gospel of Christ, spreading the soul-saving message of Jesus. And now, Ben Bailey. This is the gospel of Christ. Our world says, let your conscience be your guide. But friend, that's not what God says and not what we learn from the Apostle Paul in the book of Acts. We're so glad that you joined us for our study of the book of Acts today. We want, If you don't have your Bible, we want you to pause for just a moment, locate your Bible, as we're going to be studying today in Acts chapter 23 through 25. It's our next to last lesson in the book of Acts, and we're so glad that you joined us for this exciting, action-packed study as Paul now takes the gospel all the way to Rome itself. Today's lesson is being brought to you by individual Christians and congregations of the churches of Christ. The Lord's Church, the Church of Christ in your area, would love for you to stop by and visit their assembly. If you're looking for a place to worship, a place where you and your family can learn more about God and His Word, please visit the Lord's Church in your area. You'll find people there who love God, who are concerned about other people, who who be happy. If you'd like to know more about the Bible or the plan of salvation or, or anything about a religious matter, you'll find people there who'd be happy to sit down and discuss God's Word with you at any time. They're warm and kind and loving people, and you'll be glad that you visited with them. And so check them out on Sunday morning for worship, Sunday evening for worship, or Wednesday for Bible study. Be a great opportunity to visit the Lord's Church in your area. Also, my friend, we'd love to help you hear the gospel of Christ and your desire to know God and His Word better in your life. Please check out our website, thegospelofchrist.com. From there, you can access all our material uh, free of charge. We've got uh, audio lessons, video lessons, written material, transcripts, study questions, just a wide variety of good Bible study material, and it's all free. And so check out our website, thegospelofchrist.com. If you'd like to have a copy of today's series, eight lesson series on the book of Acts, we're making that available free of charge. Just go to our website, fill out a free media request form. We can either send that to you instantaneously as a download, or if you need a, a video copy of that, we can send a DVD or a digital audio copy as well. And so we hope that you'll check us out, visit our website. Don't forget about the Gospel of Christ app, which is available in the respective play stores. With it, nearly everybody having a smartphone, it's a great way to study the Word of God, keep up with what we're doing, and stay in touch that way. And so download it from the respective play stores and check us out on Facebook. Like us and follow us. be a great way to also stay in touch with what we're doing here at the Gospel of Christ. As we think today, in Acts chapters 23 through 25, Paul is now in a determined effort He's going to appeal to Caesar, and the gospel by default with Paul is going to go all the way to Rome and to Caesar's household as well. But as we open to Acts 23, Paul now teaches us as he discusses the matters of salvation and God's plan with some of the Jews here who are confused on this, Paul now teaches us a very practical lesson, and it's this. Conscience alone is not a safe guide in religion. Maybe you've been taught or maybe you've been told, just do what feels good or don't violate your conscience or, or if your conscience says it's okay, it's okay. Let your conscience be your guide. The old, the old idea of Jiminy Cricket that he, he, he said, that, that's not what we're talking about. That is not correct. And that is not according to the Bible. How do we know that? Look in Acts 23. Verse number one, as Paul is looking earnestly at this Jewish Sanhedrin council about to give his defense for the gospel, it says in verse one, then Paul, looking earnestly at the council, said, 
Men and brethren, I've lived in all good conscience, listen to this, before God until this day. Now, I want you to think about what those words mean and think about the import of that. Paul said, I've lived in all good conscience until right here, until this day, meaning everything Paul had done, even things he did as Saul of Tarsus, he did with a good conscience. What's that mean? In Acts chapter 7, when he is holding the coats of those who stoned Stephen, did Paul do that with a good conscience? Up till this day, yeah. In Acts chapter 8, when Paul is dragging men and women out of their homes and having them in prison for being Christians, did Paul do that with a good conscience? Absolutely. In Acts chapter 9, when Paul is breathing murders and threats against the church, did he do that with a good, did he think, did his conscience tell him he was doing the right thing? Absolutely. But was it right? Absolutely not. When Paul held the coats of those who stoned Stephen, that was as wrong as wrong could be. When Paul dragged men and women out of the church, when, he, when he's breathing threats and murders on the church, friend, that was dead wrong. Even though Paul thought it was right. It's not my conscience that's a safe guide. For the Bible says in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 through 4, that a person's conscience can be seared with a hot iron. Instead of letting my conscience be my guide, how about we let truth be our guide? John 8, verse 32. You can know the truth, and truth will set you free. You say, okay, that's all good and well, but what is truth? John 18, verse 36. My friend, the Word of God is truth. The entirety of God's commands are right. Psalm 119, 160. Jesus said, sanctify them by your truth, your word is truth. We need to let the Bible, instead of saying, let your conscience be your guide, how about we say, let's let the Bible be your guide. A conscience is only an echo of knowledge you provide for yourself. We need to let God's word be that knowledge. And then our conscience can be in tune with the word of God. The conscience created for a good purpose. It is to echo what we know. But if we don't know what we don't know, we can't let it be a good guide. But if we are guided by the Bible, the conscience can work in concert with the Word of God and help us in every way. And so in matters of salvation, we don't say let your conscience be your guide. In matters of morally right and wrong, it's not our conscience that is our guide. And, and how we worship God and how we live, the idea of let your conscience be, no, that's not how it works. And all those matters and every other matter, let the Bible be your guide. Is there any word from the Lord? Jeremiah 37, 17. What does the scripture say? That ought to be our guide. Romans chapter 4, verse number 3. And so initially in Acts 23, we learn a very powerful lesson from Saul of Tarsus. But as this scene unfolds, uh, Paul has to realize as well that God's going to work through him and there may be some persecution along the way. Look in Acts chapter 23, and I want you to notice what the Bible says beginning in verse number two. And the high priest Ananias commanded those who stood by him to strike Paul on the mouth. Then Paul said to him, God will strike you, you whitewashed wall, for you sit to judge me according to the law, and do you command me to be struck contrary to the law? And those who stood by said, Do you revile God's high priest? Then Paul said, I did not know, brethren, that he was the high priest, for it is written, You shall not speak evil of a ruler of your people. Paul had to realize here that vengeance belongs to the Lord. He's struck by this, these people that the high priest commands him to be struck by, and naturally, you might want to retaliate. And Paul verbally tells this man he shouldn't have done that, even though he didn't know he was God's high priest. And so we learn, like Paul, Romans 12, verse 17, vengeance belongs to the Lord, I will repay. I don't have to right every wrong. I, I, I don't have to correct every problem. I don't have to get back. I don't, I, I don't have to get even instead of getting mad. God's going to take care of all those things. But as Paul perceives here that there is a great conflict in this Sanhedrin, he now uses his wit and his knowledge of both of these people to get them to get mad at each other instead of at him. 
Watch what happens in Acts chapter 23, verse number 8. The Bible says, verse 7, When he said this, a dissension arose between the Pharisees and Sadducees, and the assembly was divided. For Sadducees say there's no resurrection and no angel or spirit, but the Pharisees confess both. Then there arose a loud outcry, and the scribes of the Pharisees' party arose and protested, saying, We find no evil in this man, but if a spirit or angel has spoken to him, let us not fight against God. And so as I think about this idea, friend, let's realize that, that God's law and God's principles must ring true. And Paul realized there was a problem here. And as a result, he kind of pitted both parties against each other so that he could continue his journey on. You see, the Sadducees, they didn't believe in resurrection or angels, and the Pharisees did. And so instead of having both of them go at him, they're now going at each other, uh, as we learn from the Scriptures. And so that's very good as we think about that in Acts chapter 23. Now, notice Acts chapter 23, we also learn that, uh, that we can do great things in God's kingdom. Look in verses 16 through 18, if you would please. Acts 23, look in verse number 16. So when Paul's sister, son, heard of their ambush, and he went and entered the barracks and told Paul, then Paul called one of the centurions to him and said, Take this young man to the commander, for he has something to tell him. So he took him and brought him to the commander and said, Paul the prisoner called me to him and asked me to bring this young man to you. He has something to say to you. Now, there's a conflict here. People are kind of watching out for Paul. They, they, they make this rash vow in verses 12 through 15 that they will not eat until Paul is basically dead or in prison. And so Paul's sister son overhears this and he runs and tells the Paul and Paul tells him to tell the commander, look at what good this young man did in the kingdom of God and for the cause of Christ. Isn't this a practical lesson? Young people, sometimes maybe you get the impression or you get the feeling that you can't do any good or you can't do what other people are doing or you're not ready to do that. Listen, the good that you can do, don't ever underestimate that. This young man did good. He told what he needed to tell. He went to the right people. He helped out. And friend, young people are so important in the church of God today. They're important in, in God's kingdom. God took care of Paul because of what this young lad, his nephew, told. Paul's life is saved by this commander, and as a result, the gospel spreads further. The Romans get to hear about the message. Caesar and his household get to hear it, and God's plan continues to go out. But in this context now, Paul is going to go before some very high people. Felix, Festus, and Agrippa get to hear the gospel also. Look in Acts chapter 20, uh, Acts chapter 23, and I want you to notice what the Bible says in verse number 23. The Bible says, He called for two centurions, saying, Prepare 200 soldiers, 70 horsemen, 200 spearmen to go to Caesarea at the third hour of the night and provide mounts to set Paul on. Now watch this. Bring him safely to Felix, the governor. Because of what this young man did and because of how this, this, this soldier centurion took action, now Paul is going to go before Felix, the governor of that area. Felix will work with Saul and listen to him, and then he'll call Festus, and Festus will call Agrippa, and Agrippa will eventually send him all the way to Caesar himself. But let's back up and think about this in the bigger scope of things. Who is Paul? Well, he's just a, a servant of God, a, a mouthpiece for God. Who is this young lad? Well, just a sister, son, just a little boy. But look at what both of them are accomplishing in the bigger scheme of things. How many people between where Saul Paul is now and Rome are going to be impacted by the gospel? People on that ship are. People on the island of Malta are where he's shipwrecked and people in Rome, souls are saved because of how God, how Paul and this young man let God use them for his purposes. What about us today? How many people can be impacted for good by what you do in this life? How many souls can be saved by us letting God 
use us. How many how much good can be done in the kingdom if we can just work hand in hand, walk hand in hand and work with God in every way? And so what a wonderful chapter, Acts chapter 23 is. Now turn your attention, if you would, to Acts chapter 24. And I want you to see that what people think of us isn't really as important as what God thinks about us. Look at Acts chapter 24 and notice what is said about Paul. Here's the accusation that is made in Acts 24, verse 5. They say before, Fest, before Felix, we found this man a plague, a creator of dissension among all the Jews throughout the world, and a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes. Now you talk about a bad, giving Paul a bad rap. He's a plague. He's a creator of dissension or division. He's a ringleader of this wild sect of the Nazarenes. Was any of that true about Paul? Well, of course not. Is Paul a crazy man? No, even though some thought so. Was Paul going to turn the world? No. What people think about us isn't as important as what God thinks about us. To hear God say, well done, good and faithful servant. Friend, that'll mean more than what anybody might say bad or good about you. Now in Acts chapter 24, I want you to notice Paul before Felix. We talk about the power of the gospel. We talk about it going places and reaching, reaching people. Look in Acts chapter 24, and I want you to notice beginning in verse 23. Paul is before Felix, and it says, When Felix heard these things, having more accurate knowledge of the way, he adjourned the proceedings and said, When Lysias, the commander, comes down, I will make a decision on your case. So he commanded the centurion to keep Paul and to let him have liberty and told him not to forbid any of his friends to provide for or visit him. And after some days, when Felix came with his wife Drusilla, who was Jewish, he sent for Paul and heard him concerning faith in Christ. Now, as he reasoned about righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come, Felix was afraid and answered, Go away for now. When I have a more convenient time, I will call upon thee. Friend, I want you to think about the impact and the far-reaching impact of the gospel here. Already went before Felix, the governor. It's going to go before Lysias, the commander. We hear about that, but now, but now uh, Festus as well, Festus and Felix. And so as Paul stands there and preaches before these men, uh, Felix and Drusilla and, and, and Festus there, he says three things. He reasoned about righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come. If you study a little bit in your Bible, as you study about, about Felix and his wife, Drusilla, history pretty clearly records that they were not good, moral, outstanding people. She may have had a Jewish background, but they were not known for their morality. They were known for their immorality. They were known for their licentious behavior. They were known for indulging in every type of pleasure that you might could imagine. As many of the religious, uh, as many of the elite in political positions did in that day and age. And so when Paul stood there, he probably knew these things and he reasoned about righteousness, how to live a right life before God, what is morally right, what is morally knowing their moral state. Paul talked about sins that had to hit home with them. He reasoned about righteousness, about self-control to a couple and probably more people in that audience who cared little about self-control but more about indulging in every pleasure you could imagine. Self-control hit home. And then Paul told why you need to do all that. Why live righteous? Why live a life of self-control? because of the judgment to come. God has appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness, and he has given proof of it by the man he's ordained, the one he raised from the dead, Acts chapter 17, verse number 31. Friend, there's a day coming when all of us will stand before the almighty throne of God. We'll give an account of ourselves and the life we've lived, Romans 14, 12, 2 Corinthians 10, verses three through five. In view of the judgment day, 
the encouragement offered here is, let's live a righteous life. Let's live a life of self-control. And isn't it sad what Felix and his wife Drusilla here say? They say, go away for now. When I've got a more convenient time, I'll call upon thee. Friend, I want you to think for just a moment. When are you sure, besides right now, when are you sure you'll have a more convenient time? Maybe we need to ask, when are you sure you'll have more time? Now is the accepted time. Today is the day of salvation. 2 Corinthians 6, 1 and 2. There's mo no more convenient time than to obey now what you know now. Tomorrow won't work. James 4, 14 says, what is your life? It's but a vapor here for a little while, then it vanishes away. We don't know what tomorrow will bring. Sufficient for the day is the things we've got to deal with now. Matthew 6, verse number 34. And so life is short. Life is brief. Don't wait for a more convenient time. That time may never come. Obey now what you know now. There's no more convenient time than when you hear the truth to obey God's truth. That's what makes Almighty God happy. Now, in Acts chapter 25, Paul is now, as he goes before these leaders, he's now going to pretty much become fed up with what they're doing and say, I'm tired of all this. I want to go to the highest of the high. I want, to go to the, I want to go to the top of the ladder in the governmental issue, and I want to talk to Caesar himself. And any Roman citizen could make that appeal, and that's what Paul is going to do. Look in your Bible in Acts chapter 25, verse number 11. Paul is not afraid to die, but look at what he says in verse number 11. If I'm an offender or have committed anything deserving of death, I do not object to dying, but if there is nothing in these things of which these men accuse me, no one can deliver me, no one can deliver me to them. I appeal to Caesar. With these words, I, I, I wonder do we see what's actually happening here? The gospel is going to the highest power of that day, and God's message is being spread as far as men knew to take it at that time. Will it go other places when it gets to Rome? No doubt it will. But we're talking about to the uttermost parts of the world. To Rome itself, the gospel now goes because Paul appealed to Caesar. Look in verse 19, if you would, of Acts chapter 25. Of these people, verse 18, when the accusers stood up, they brought no accusation against him of such things as I supposed, but had some questions against him about their own religion, about a certain Jesus who had died, who Paul affirmed. To be alive. This is not a, uh, although recorded in the Bible, this is Agrippa sending a letter to Caesar. And in that letter from Agrippa to Caesar, he gives historical proof of Jesus. Paul is being sent to you because of some of these customs and because of Jesus, who sees said alive, others said is dead. But regardless, his letter, the letter Agrippa sends, all the way to Rome itself, to Caesar's hands, is historical proof from Agrippa, a non-believer, that Jesus really existed. And so Paul is given the opportunity in Acts chapters 23, 24, and 25 to give a defense of the gospel. Esther 4.14 reminds us of this. Mordecai said this to Esther. Who, when she's about to go in, before the king, make her request, try to save her people. Mordecai, she says to Mordecai, who knows whether you've come to the king? Or Mordecai says to her, who knows whether you've come to the kingdom for such a time as this? Paul came for such a moment as this. Are we seizing the moments and the opportunities along with our talents and abilities? Are we using those to the best of our ability? I wonder how long it would have taken. I wonder what efforts, would, if Paul had chosen not to do this, or if something, how would the gospel, God would have got it there. But imagine the souls that would have been negatively affected if this hadn't have gone through. Friend, our appeal to you today is very simple. God's message and God's plan is a simple message and a simple plan. God didn't make it hard. Paul is going to take that gospel to Caesar himself because the gospel is a simple, understandable, provable plan. Do all men accept the truth and the evidence? No. 
but it's understandable and it's simple. And friend, we ask today, have you obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ? Have you submitted your life to the will of God? Are you sure you're ready to stand before God in judgment for righteousness and self-control, just as Felix heard about? If not, then we urge you today to get ready. The only way to be ready is to prepare ahead of time and to get ready. I don't know how much time you've got. Nobody knows how much time. We, we, we just don't know that, but we do know. Right now, I have an opportunity to hear God's Word, to see that for myself in my own copy of the Bible, and make a decision to obey God. And so here's what the Bible teaches one must do to be saved. You first have to hear the Word of God. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. John chapter 8, verse number 24. Once you've heard that Word, you must believe in Jesus as the Son of God. Unless you believe that I'm He, you'll surely die in your sins. John 8, verse 24. Then you must be willing to repent of sin, turn from wickedness, repent, and be converted. Acts 3, verse 19. Having made the good confession, the Bible teaches you must be baptized in water for the forgiveness of your sins. Peter, in the very first sermon on Pentecost, said, repent and be baptized, every one of you, for the forgiveness of your sins. Acts 2, verse 38. Jesus said, he that believes and is baptized will be saved. And so, friend, we ask you today, have you done that? If not, why have you not done that? Maybe you'd like to learn more. Maybe you'd like to study more. Maybe you've got some questions about the matter of salvation. We'd be happy to help you in that. The local church of Christ in your area, we'd be happy to sit down and study God's word with you. We're just so happy that you joined us today for our broadcast. And we want to encourage you, join us next time for our final lesson on the book of Acts. Today's closed captions are brought to you by Christian Family Bookstore in Chattanooga, Tennessee. We encourage you to visit thechristianfamilybookstore.com for all your Christian book needs. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the Churches of Christ with its whole aim to take the Gospel to the whole world. We do that through TV, Internet, free media, and streaming. Our motto truly is to take the whole gospel to the whole world, and we believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious programs today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wallet. The gospel of Christ. Visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials, including audio and video of our lessons. Request your copy of today's lesson by completing a media request form online. On-demand downloads are also available at thegospelofchrist.com. We would love to hear from you. Email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com or call 844 844- Six Gospel. You may also write us at the address on your screen. Search your app store for The Gospel of Christ to access our mobile app on your this smartphone. Is the gospel of Christ.